Good morning. Hello. Um, people are still wandering in, but I guess we should get started. This is our final um, forum for the year 2023. And today we have, thanks to our forum committee member, Bryce Hamilton, we have esteemed Plymouth member, Jim Len Lenfesty. I've been saying that wrong for a long time. I got it today. <laughs> So um, in some ways he needs no introduction because <clears throat> we all know him as the leader of the Literary Witness Series poetry group in Plymouth, but he's done a lot of other things. He was on the editorial board of the Star Tribune where he won several page one awards for excellence. He has published 16 collections of poems, personal essays, anthologies, and a memoir. <clears throat> And in 2020, he received the Case Sexton Award and for significant contributions of leadership in the Minnesota literary community. In 2024, next year, Milkweed Editions will publish his newest poetry collection called Time Remaining Bo Body Odes, Praise Songs, Oddities, Amazements. <laughs> he serves on the boards of Red Dragonfly Press in Minnesota, the Hellbender Poetry Gathering in North Carolina, which I think is where you went to college. No. Oh, sorry, got that wrong. <laughs> and the founder of Poets, Writers, and Musicians Against the War on the Earth. So, there you go. Welcome to you. Whoa! <laughs> where did you all come from? What a delight to see all your shining faces. It's an honor to be here. Got the name spelled right and the rest of it we don't need to know about. Um, uh, and I bring you news. I bring you news for all of you, good news for all of you. Your obituary is coming up. <laughs> and I can tell you exactly what's gonna be in it. I can tell you exactly what's going to be in it, and all of you should be very proud. You will all have very large columns in your local papers because of all the things you do in the outer world. Your family, your community work, your, your, your triumphs, and possibly your tragedies will be all inventoried in your obituary, and you will be remembered thusly. And I can tell you what's not going to be in it, and you know what's not going to be in it. There will not be one word about your inner life. Not one word about your uh, love, grief, sorrow, joy, sadness, despair, anguish, heartbreak, loneliness, longing, gratitude, hope, calm, ecstasy. We diminish this part of our life by calling it the emotional life. A distancing Latinate word, we must erase all Latinate words from our vocabulary or worse, mere feelings. Because you know, you know from the day you were born and before they are as solid as blood and bone. That other real life which you live every day at, and at night in your dreams. We might well call it the soul life. Emerson said language is fossil poetry. So what is the etymology the fossil poetry of the word soul. In our language, it means originally coming from and belonging to the sea, from old, from Proto-Germanic uh, called Siwas, meaning sea, S-E-A, because it was supposed to be the stopping place for the soul before birth and after death. Is C not the perfect image for the soul? This, this substance, solid and liquid at once, which runs down your face in the rain and which calms you when you lie, sit by the stream, uh, and which appears when you're touched out of your body as tears, salty tears. And we know now that the C is the perfect image because it's this liquid from which we emerged as a species, as an individual from the amniotic fluid in which we swim, which runs elusively through our fingers. But how to access it? How do you access it, this interior sea 
that's been with you all along. And, and that spark of consciousness before. As words were said, our birth is but a sleep and a forgetting. The soul that rises with us, our life star, it has elsewhere its setting and cometh from afar. Not in entire forgetfulness and not in utter nakedness, but trailing clouds of glory do we come from God who is our home. Heaven lies about us in our infancy. And we know now from science that the amniotic fluid approximates the salinity of the sea. And we know now from science that our ancestors once lived in the sea. And that some, our close cousins, the cetaceans and the pinnipeds, had the good sense to emerge, return to the sea and that buoyancy. Yet you and I barely know how to talk about that fluid interior landscape, that sea, this heaven that takes up half our lives, including our dreams. The late poet Robert Bly, whom most of you know or know of, was interviewed by a hopeful student writer back in his college days, Lewis Hyde, who later went on to uh, win a MacArthur in his, by his own right. He asked Bly two big-eyed student questions. Do you believe in God? Are you afraid of death? Bly answered, as was typical with him, in an image. There is a skin or a hide between ourselves and our inner being. And in the West, that skin is very thick. Inside us, there's a sea, and that sea is your inner life. Your spiritual life, your sexual impulses, everything you've gotten from the memory stores of evolution. And there's the outer world made of buildings and automobiles. And these two worlds can't rub against each other. It's too painful, therefore you develop a hide, exactly like a cow develops a hide. <laughs> you don't want her guts to rub against the barn. Now take one more look. The etymology of emotion from the Latin means to move out, to move out. But from where? But from the body, of course, to the outer world, the inner world, to the outer world. But how? How does it move out? There's only two real ways. One, with shrieks and anger and groans and wild dancing, hugs, despair, depression, anger, the pounding of fists, pounding with fists, shouts, murder, the cold turn on one's back, a form of self-murder. And after it all, tears. Yes, tears, clear, salty windows to the interior sea, the interior life, the interior soul. Or else, or else, through the tactile processes of art, now consider again the word feelings, actually a form of touch from Old English felin, to touch or have a sensory experience of. As a journalist, I learned there's a blood-brain barrier between expressing the facts of the outer world and the facts of the inner world. When I left work at the editorial board of the Star Tribune, my head was hot. When I leave a day at the keyboard writing creative work, my hands are hot. So how does a work of art reach into the sea within us, move us to tears? Well, Rembrandt knew, we know that. When in 1666, he painted Lucretia. That's famous painting is now at the MIA. The painting of a pivotal woman in Roman history. Famously chased, she was sexually assaulted by the son of the tyrant. She fended him off but felt her honor violated, though her body was not. She confessed the attack to her husband, then took a knife and plunged it into her chest. And what we see in the face of Lucretia, excuse me, <coughs> at the MIA today, is the embodiment of grief. What Rembrandt's audience did not know, it was painted during a pivotal grief in his own life. 
his beloved common law wife hounded to her death by the puritanical culture of, his, of Amsterdam at the time. My daughter, as a brooding young artist, would sit in front of Lucretia for hours and hours in wonder at the technique that was breaking her heart. Van Gogh said of Rembrandt, Rembrandt is so deeply mysterious that he says things for which there are no words in any language. And of course, music, right, is soul music. All music, I say, is soul music. Strumming vocal and other chords deep inside us, raising waves in the sea of the soul. As Bill Holm wrote in one of his masterpieces playing the black piano, playing Haydn for the Angel of Death, the particular poem, the piano tells us things, tells things to your hands. You never let yourself hear from others. Calm down, do your work. Laugh, love reason more, your mask less. God exists, though not as the church said. To understand this language, you must sometimes patiently play the same piece over and over and over for years. And then when you expect nothing, the music will let go its wisdom. All art, and they're all, we're all artists in our way, all art is tactile. All art is tactile. That is, it's the body's touch, not the brain. And a major entry point is grief, and a major exit point is ecstasy. The tools, you know, brush, camera, piano keys, potter's clay, sculptor's chisel, the writer's pen or keyboard, all tactile, all a direct link from the hand to heart through touch, a freeway to the interior. And I use the word freeway consciously because it's free. I.e., there's no cost to uncover or touch or exhibit your feelings, your emotions, your inner life, to lay out these riches before you, to be amazed. Robert Frost said, no tears in the writer, no tears in the reader. No surprise in the writer, no surprise in the reader. And Mary Oliver said, when it's over, when it's over, I want to say all my life, I was a bride married to amazement. So let's spend the next few minutes talking about a few artists whose stories may surprise you. Ordinary people who freely found the interior life. In 1848, a brilliant young woman dropped out of Mount Holyoke College. After one year, never went back. Never married, had few friends, an epistolary romance or two, lived a spinster life, reclusive life, rarely leaving home, dying in her birth home at age 55 of Bright's disease, a resume of zero. Zero. She left one instruction for her younger sister, sister Lavinia, burn my letters. What are letters? News between herself and the outer world. She didn't say anything about this box in her office, which contained 1,800 poems, only seven of which had been published in her lifetime. Her first volume was published by her brother's lover, Mabel Loomis, four years after her death. The complete poems of Emily Dickinson arrived in 1955. The corrected volume, uh, 112 years after after her death, and all she ever asked herself, Emily Dickinson, all she ever asked of herself or of anyone is, dare you see a soul at white heat? Dare you see a soul at white heat? Then crouch within the door, red is the fire's common tent, but when the vivid ore has vanquished flame's conditions, it quivers from the forge without a color, but light of unanointed blaze. Least village, the least village, the smallest town, boasts its blacksmith, whose anvil's even ring stands symbol for the finer forge that soundless tugs within. Refining these impatient oars with hammers and with blaze until the designated light repudiate the forge. And how did she survive a life of such solitude 
and seclusion. Well, the soul selects her own society, then shuts the door to her divine majority, present no more. Dig this, unmoved, she notes the chariots pausing at her low gate. Unmoved, an emperor be kneeling upon her mat. <laughs> I've known her, the soul from an ample nation, to choose one, to choose just one. Then close the vows of her attention like stone. In that same year, 1848, a young journalist and printer, after failing as a magazine publisher in New Orleans, returned to Brooklyn, where he grew up. There he read an essay by the greatest writer of his generation, Ralph Waldo Emerson, calling for a new American poetry. In 1855, he self-published 300 copies of his own poems printed on waste paper leaves from the printing shop where he worked, typeset and bound by himself, and of course reviewed by himself rapturously, <laughs> exclaiming in the pages of the United States Review, an American bard at last. <laughs> Walt Whitman, who said, I celebrate myself and sing myself, and what I assume you shall assume, for every atom belonging to me as good belongs to you. I loaf and invite my soul. I lean and loaf at my ease, observing a spear of summer grass. I believe a leaf of grass is no less than the journey work of the stars. And a mouse is a miracle enough to stagger sextillions of infidels. <laughs> God, I wish I'd written that. <laughs> Why? Who makes much of a miracle? Who makes much of a miracle? As to me, I know nothing but miracles. Scorned for his unrepentant openness and unusual style, he died revered, the great gray poet. I bequeath myself to the, to the dirt to grow from the grass I love. If you want to find me again, look for me under your boot soles. In 1866, a brilliant student at Oxford glanced too long at a fellow male student. His heart shuddered, and he suddenly converted to Catholicism to become a priest. He became a Jesuit priest, his life a misery of denial. The conflict between his religious obligations, his poetic talent, his love of nature, and sexual need caused him to feel he failed it all. I wake and feel the fell of dark, not day. He burned most poems in despair and died of typhoid at age 55 after a miserable life teaching in hideous, dank Dublin, another Victorian coal smoke city of dreadful night. A poet named James Thompson wrote a huge long poem called The City of Dreadful Night. You can't believe what people were breathing in the coal smoke cities of the day. It took his friend Robert Bridges, who later became the England's Poet Laureate, to publish his first collection in 1918, nearly 30 years after his death. And yet, Gerard Manley Hopkins developed a new genius of poetic expression, what he called sprung rhythm. Imprisoned in that damn Dublin teach cell where he taught, he, in that Paul, he wrote one of the most ecstatic descriptions of nature in our language remembering a hike he took to the wilderness way at the very north end of Loch Lomond. And if you look on a map, there's a little dot up there called Inversnade. Inversnade, this darksome burn, horseback brown as roll rock high road, roaring down in coop and comb the fleece of his foam, flutes and low to the lake falls home. A wind puff bonnet of a wind puff bonnet of fawn froth turns and twindles over the broth of a pool so pitch black, fell frowning, it rounds and rounds despair to drowning. Degged with dew, dappled with dew with the groins of the braise that the brook treads through, wiry heath packs, flitches of fern, and the bead bunny ash that lies over the burn. What would the world be 
Once bereft of wet and of wildness, let them be left, ah, wildness and wet. Long live the weeds in the wilderness yet. I used those last four lines in an editorial of the Star Tribune and we won the wilderness battle. His father dead in 1788, when he was eight, the, a boy, the boy sent to boarding school for a lonely, studious childhood until Cambridge, plagued with horrible teeth his whole life. He was prescribed laudanum, which is a form of opium, to deal with the pain. He took it all his life. So he, when he was not yet well known, he, he had a, what he described as a laudanum dream. And uh, Samuel Taylor Coleridge, a man yet of few prospects, ended what some say is the greatest poem in the English language, Kubla Khan, with this. A damsel with a dulcimer in a vision I once saw it was an Abyssinian maid, and on her dulcimer she played, singing of Mount Abra. Could I revive within me her symphony and songs as deep delight would win me that with music loud and long, I would build those caves of ice, those castles in air, and all who saw would see me there and all would cry, beware, beware, his flashing eyes, his floating hair. Weave a circle round him thrice and close your eyes in holy dread, for he on honey dew hath fed and drunk the milk of paradise. Ecstasy. <laughs> Son of a well-off Irish Protestant painter and Northern I Ireland aristocratic Protestant mother, William Butler Yeats lived his youth in Sligo. All was his vision of his happy home. When he was working in the concrete jungles of, uh, of London as a man of 25, he saw a small water fountain in the window of a store, one of those displays with you know little, little ball being held in the air, a little water, and it reminded him of the paradise he left behind. You, when you think of your cabin or your trip to Lake Superior, or, or your trip to Lake Michigan, or your trip to your l lakes in our world, the trip to visit water and be consoled by water. And he wrote The Lake Isle at Industry, one of the greatest poems in our era. I will arise, and it's, this is you, think of yourself. You're sitting at your desk uh, going over your insurance policies. <laughs> I will arise and go now and go to Industry. A small cabin I will build there of clay and wattles made. Nine bean rows will I have there and a hive for the honeybee and live alone in the bee loud glade. And I shall find some peace there, for peace comes dropping slow, dropping from the veils of the morning to where the cricket sings. There midnight's all a glimmer, noon's a purple glow, evening filled with the linnet's wings. I will arise and go now, for always night and day, I hear lake water lapping and low sounds by the shore. Up on the pavement, where all the pavement's gray, I hear it in my deep heart's core. The world's longest long vowel, core. Long vowels are the beat of poetry. Longing, longing. A radiant beauty, the toast of early 20th century P St. Petersburg, Russia, author of two poetry collections of a rare sensuousness that made her absolutely celebrated throughout Russia. Famous in her 20s, married a poet who relentlessly pursued her, then abandoned her. Uh, that's what those guys do. <laughs> Later in Paris, she had an intense love affair with Emilio Modigliani and uh, had an incredible rich, young, brilliant life. She returned, then she returned to St. Petersburg to two unimaginable calamities, except we can imagine them now. We don't have to imagine them. One, World War I, two, the Stalin years. At World War I, she said, we grew 100 years old in a day. 
Think of the people of Ukraine. Think of what's going on in the Middle East. We grew 100 years old in a day. Oh, pardon me, it's better than that. We grew 100 years older in a single hour. Then the Bolshevik Revolution, her husband executed early in Stalin's gulag, her only son arrested, vanished her poetry banned. For 17 months, she went every day to the prison in Leningrad, every day to try to get news of her son. This is a quote from her. One day, somebody in the crowd identified me. Remember, she had been a famous poet. Somebody in the crowd identified me. Standing behind me was a woman with lips blue from cold who had, of course, never heard me called by name before. Now she started out of her torpor, common to us all, and asked me in a whisper, in a whisper, everyone whispered then, can you describe this? Can you describe this? And I said, I can. Then something of a, like a smile passed fleeting over what had once been her face. Anna Akhmatova, who, who said, today I have so much to do. I must kill memory once and for all. I must turn soul to stone. I must learn to live again. And Anna Akhmatova said in the poem, Solitude, so many stones have been thrown at me that I'm not frightened of them anymore. And the pit has become a solid tower, tall among towers. I thank the builders, the thrower of stones, may care and the sadness pass them by. From here, I'll see the sun rise earlier and hear the sun's last ray rejoices. And into the windows of my room, the northern breezes often fly. And from my hand, a dove eats grains of wheat. As for my unfinished page, as for my unfinished page, the muse's tawny hand, divinely calm and delicate, will finish it. The muse, the muse, the voice of your inner life, that ancient from ancient Greek religion, the inspirational goddesses of literature, science, the arts, that mysterious voice that dictates to our lips and fingertips our inner vision. Anna Akhmatova was shortlisted for the Nobel Prize in 1965, excuse me, and 66, the year she passed away. Well, a 1950s man in a gray flannel suit a presumed soulless organization man, VP of a prominent insurance company in Hartford, Connecticut, walked every day to the office. Most of the poems I've written, at least in recent years, have been written in the morning on my way to the office. A quiet man in a quiet suburban house in a quiet marriage who loved his job, a national expert on surety bonds. Yeah. Uh, and would not leave his job, though offered a teaching sinecure at Harvard. Wallace Stevens, who wondered, uh, I do not know which to prefer. I do not know which to prefer, the beauty of inflections or the beauty of innuendos. The blackbird whistling or just after. And I know noble accents and lucid, inescapable rhythms, but I know, too, that the blackbird is involved in what I know. What's the blackbird? It's that mysterious thing, right? That you have to, he, gives a, he gives an image for it. He gives a, but you know, it's that mysterious thing. Uh, so I know noble accents and lucid inescapable rhythms, but I know too that the blackbird is involved in what I know. An African-American child moved with her family from Topeka, Kansas as part of the Great Migration to Chicago's South Side in the 1920s, where she lived to her death in the year 2000. What chance did she have in this deeply racist city and nation, but she was determined to write what she saw. I am an organic Chicagoan, she said. Living there has given me a multiplicity of characters to aspire for. I hope to live there the rest of my days, and she did. That's my headquarters. 
wrote Gwendolyn Brooks. After marriage and two children, she worked as a typist to support her writing. First published in the local African-American press, she became the Poet Laureate of Chicago, the Poet Laureate of Illinois, and the Poet Laureate of the United States. And she wrote this, this is the most succinct story of what we're talking about, art. Art can survive the last bugle of the last bureaucrat. <laughs> Art can survive the inarticulate choirs of the marketeers, the stolid and stately places, the f all flabby gallantries, all that will fail. Lending our strength to keep art breathing, we doubly extend, refine, we clarify, leading ourselves to halt the harried through the icy carols and bannets of this hour. The divisions, vanities, the bent flowers of the hour. We hail what heals and sponsors and restores. Well, after the gifts, of a stable family, education, marriage, parenthood, a gaggle of employments, the last on the editorial board of the Star Tribune, I was finally able to attend in my 60s a poetry festival, one on Florida's Atlantic coast. After my week there, as I stood on the beach, I felt my inner life surging around me like the Atlantic waves. This is how I learned what I am looking for. After he retired from teaching, oops, pardon me, my friend George Morrison, artist, after he retired from teaching, spent the last decade of his life in his studio on the, on the North Shore of Lake Superior painting the horizon. He painted hundreds, maybe thousands of horizons, each one different. I have been in a gallery surrounded by them, each one different as he tried and failed to capture the light. Each painting of failure costing the rest of us hundreds and thousands of dollars so he could keep on trying and failing until he died at his easel with Lake Superior, his divine bafflement, a line of shifting colors outside his plate glass window. I thought of George as I stood in the wave break of the Atlantic Ocean at Del Rey, watching the waves roll in to me, one mountain range after another in predictable periods, unstoppable and forever, yet each one different and impossible. I stood gazing through the clear windows of the waves, seeing the world below, shifting shapes of sand, shells of living things, maybe a fish, a pompano, in and out of sight. Out past the yachts and the fishing boats and the tankers, where sand gives way to darkness at a depth and pressure only imaginable. There is what I'm looking for. Its shape is ravenous and, excuse me, its shape is ravenous and terrible and it is singing. So, a final poem. The son of a hard-working alcoholic row crop farmer in western Minnesota, his older brother dying in a pickup wreck, a hard-working alcoholic row crop farmer. My late neighbor Robert Bly became the most consequential international poet of the last 60 years. Speaking to us in enduring images. The poem, the following poem was a guzzle, a Persian form which he loved and adapted to, and I think it's the form which completely fit his breathtaking imagistic imagination. A, a, a guzzle, each uh, three line verse, subject is different, it all ends in the same word. So there's five verses here, and it's called listening. The goose cries and there's no one to save her. So many cheeps come from the nest down by the river. If God isn't listening, why are we listening? 
Think of that, that image. You can just see the fox walking through the reeds along the river, right? Coming up to take the, take the goslings. The goose cries and there's no one to save her. So many cheeps come from the nest down by the river. If God isn't listening, why are we listening? Very deep water covers most of the globe. Whenever I see it, I think of St. John, St. John the Baptist. There is no remedy for deep water, but listening. There is no remedy for deep water, but listening. Here's the best three-line love poem you'll ever hear. The king and queen already know about love. They search for each other through the whole deck. <laughs> While we play our hands, they are listening. <laughs> and then this is all of us. This is all of us. Like thousands of others, I'm eating beet soup and some Russian in. People write letters to me from God, but I'm not listening. The hermit said, the hermit said, because the world is mad. Anybody disagree with that? The hermit said, because the world is mad, who would have seen Hitler come back in the form of Putin? I mean, I didn't see it. Who would have seen the Middle East blow up? Who would have seen, and yet, this is our story. The hermit knew. The hermit said, because the world is mad, the only way through the world is to learn the arts and double the madness. Are you listening? <laughs> Thank you for listening. The light is that working? Oh, yeah. um, Jim, sometimes I get the privilege of taking mm -hmm. folks on a little tour of Plymouth, and sometimes they ask, and sometimes they don't ask about the art on the walls. And I will say, many at Plymouth believe that art is is one path to, to the divine. Absolutely. And sometimes they look at me like I've said a wonderful thing, <laughs> and sometimes they look at me like it's. Uh, nothing that makes any sense, and sometimes I get the feeling that I violated one of their religious principles. And I'm, I'm wondering how, how you reflect on, on, on that in either in this church or in churches in general or in the world. They hadn't heard this talk. <laughs> Seriously, I mean, you know, because art is the way to reveal our inner life, which is certainly our spiritual life. Uh, our emotional life, our, our, and our feelings, and uh, that's how we see it before us. As, as I say, the other thing is to punch out your friend, you know, that's, and you can do that too. We all do plenty of that. And kids running around with guns these days, that's not so good, because those little bits of anger get taken a step farther. But really, I hadn't heard this talk. This is about that. This is about seeing and understanding that all art is a way to reveal your, your inner life and your inner life is what art is. I mean, think of Michelangelo, you know, you go, okay, he built, he built these damn marble things, you know. What's he got? He's got a chisel and a hammer. It's a tactile process and he imagines with his body this incredible structure. And that's what he's feeling and saying and telling us. Yeah, go ahead, somebody, yeah. Jim, that was just brilliant, but my question to you is, what, a, what moment were you inspired to be a poet, and what caused that? What inspired you? Well, thank you, John. Now, obviously, you haven't read my book about going to China. <laughs> <laughs> In there, I mean, it's, it, part of it is a, a strange, uh, almost genetic factor. 
There's a little, if I can remember, I, got a little, I have a little eight-line Chinese-style poem called That Boy Needs a Book in His Hands. I'll screw it up, I'll give it to you. So when the portrait painter sat me down to capture me at three, she said, that boy needs a book in his hands. She painted my eyes big, a lie. <laughs> but my hands did not lie. Those are the first four lines. What I mean is, this portrait painter, she lived right down the block. We're not talking Picasso here. She lived a block away, and we all, my mother sent us all down there. She painted my sister, who is a freaking physical stunner. I mean, she's a skier today at 83, bombing down all over, and she's an amazing physical, and a physical therapist, painted her in this dance pose. She saw her for that physical side of her. For me, that boy needs a book in his hands. I can't explain it, but that was right there at three years old. I, I can't even believe, I looked, by the way, I have that portrait. I looked at it, I said, it can't be three years old. And I was three years old, and there I'm sitting there with a the book. <laughs> so there's that book. I always love reading words for me. Uh, it's interesting to come to a place like this. They say, do you have visuals? No. Why would, what? <laughs> I have words. That's all I have. And so the poetry, when I, my parents shipped me off to boarding school, and one of the fun things that happened there, my best friend, Tim LaRich, friend of this young woman right here, she babysat his kids in Cleveland. But Tim's bro older brother was a poet, and we would smuggle, of course, we're studying Shelley and uh, all the wonderful things, and you want me to do Osmandios, I'll do it for you. <laughs> uh, but what we're smuggling is Lawrence Ferlinghetti. Those were the days. Times have changed dramatically. Somebody asked me when I gave this talk a month ago in St. Paul, so what happened to poetry? Where is it? I said, well, two things happened. A, a wide open radio spectrum and the cheap, cheap electric guitar. And, uh, but also a third thing happened in the world of poetry that ar arguably is not good. Remember all the great poems and songs from the Greeks, the Chinese for sure, 2,500 years ago, they were all sung with, with stringed instruments, the lute. Uh, the great story of, uh, oh, who's the Greek, tri Greek trickster? Uh, um, name is escaping me, but his story is this. Oh, who am I thinking of? No, 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 the trickster. No, 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 no. Hermes, thank you, thank you, thank you. Hermes, so Hermes is the guy who just plays around, screws up things, and good for him. And so he steals some of, some of uh, Zeus's cattle. Well, Zeus is not happy about this. And you don't mess with Zeus. So he comes, Zeus comes along with his thunderbolt to blow him up, which is what he does. That's his thing, you know, right? But Hermes takes a turtle and turns it over, cleans it out, and puts strings on it, and begins to sing. And he charms Zeus, and that's the beginning of music and poetry. Yeah. Music soothes the savage beast, right? Right? And uh, so that's the beginning of it in, in our era, you know, which the Greeks, it goes back farther. All those songs were sung. What happened with the uh, advent of the Imagists, was let's leave behind meter and, and uh, meter and rhyme, and we, some great much greatness came from that. But also, we lost the radio spectrum. Uh, all the hot tickets on, on the on the radio singing singing songwriters they're all in rhyme and meter, and understandably so. I mean, including Dylan, who you know they all use rhyme and meter. So we kind of gave that up, and that's the key to memory. It's the key to being able to hang on to something in memory. So um, how did I get into it? So then actually, uh, when we moved here in 74, I knew a poet down the block, and he invited me to do a thing at the Walker, and I did. And it was very sensual stuff, I have to admit now. And a woman took me out to lunch and propositioned me, and I said, well, I can't do that again. <laughs> <laughs> That's a private story, but it actually happened. I was too dense, I had no idea what she was doing. <laughs> but but uh, I, I wrote poems all along. I have a book of 50 years of poems from a marriage, which begins, I have a child who's 58 years old, and a birth all the way through. I've been doing it all along as a way to express my inner life, to be candid. I mean, I didn't, I didn't imagine this. I didn't imagine any books. I got lots of books now, but none of that was imagined. I just. 
And I, one last detail. So I have a, one of my best friends, the oldest friend here, a guy named Mark Odegaard, is a brilliant, brilliant graphic designer. But Mark, we would meet once a month for breakfast for decades and with his friend Joe. And Joe was a psychologist whose love was Irish music. Mark was head of the graphic design of the Science Museum at the time, but also doing his own work. And I would talk poetry. And he said, finally said, Jim, stop talking about poetry and make a little book. Pick 10, 10 best poems. I'll design it. We'll staple it. And off it goes. And not long after I had that little book called a marriage book, a little thing, uh, uh, um, I got a call from a friend of mine who was an artist at Perry Ingley, and he said, you know, I have an opening. You got any poems? Well, so happens. But anyway, that was the first to see them in paper, and then it kind of went. But it really blossomed when our, you know, we had four kids, not necessarily a good idea, not a bad idea, and our fourth it took some time. So, but when she actually left the house and I left the paper, I had time, which I'd never had before. So the time is, I have to admit, since 2000, I published 16 books. Ah! I mean, essays, anthologies, and of course, this love. Did I get near what you were asking about? Yeah. I have a question. Oh, sorry. Uh, yes, Jim, do you have your notebook, that little flip, with you in your pocket? Uh, no, I run out of them, so I take a piece of paper and okay. I fold it up like this in case something uh, okay. occurs. So, so this was such a wonderful formal presentation from you, you did not sob once. <laughs> you were working at a higher level, you know, today, and I, I rejoice, though, that, that question about uh, why their poetry is not quite what it was, perhaps, mm -hmm. that's a myth. But, yeah, totally. Uh, but what uh, Jim does is take his heart and his head and put it on paper. And, and not only that, so 30 years later, it's still there, and tears can run down his cheeks because he's got this uh, index of his poems that are working there. So uh, his soul has been well searched. <laughs> and, uh, David, uh, thank you for embarrassing me with that. Yeah. <laughs> I really, truly, I, my friend Peter Kramer, who came to my uh, premiere of uh, the marriage book, which I did here at Plymouth, and we had a big crowd and it was wonderful. He, he, Peter's drawing all the time. The drawing he sent to me after is he, he likes to draw me as a little monk. And the monk is like this, with a big handkerchief in his face. <laughs> I was, you know, I really don't like it, but I have a very short fuse for the motion of life. I mean, and I, it's, it's truly embarrassing when I do public presentations. But, so thank you for reminding me that, that I don't, that, but it's true, it's right there. It's, and it's, I'd like to think my, my skill with words is somewhat akin to David Aston's when he stands out at Crex Meadows and we say, where, where are the Sandhill Cranes, Dave? You said they were gonna be around. He said, just stand right here. And then one flies over your head and then two and then 10 and then a thousand. <laughs> yeah, I have a different kind of question for you. You know, we've been having these conversations for the last six months about the budget and our values. Yeah. And one of the ways that people characterize Plymouth is as a very intellectual church. What can we do as a community and as a sort of, um, as a church community to make more room for the emotional life in our congregation and in our communal life? Well, I mean, first, I'm here because there is a lot of room for that. But, but what, what Plymouth has always done, I mean, I came here to one sermon in the 70s. I, mean, I couldn't believe Howard Kahn. What did he just say? <laughs> uh, and art, in my time, has been central to the operation here. So when Sam King uh, th thought of having a, a poetry program, the whole church went, yeah, because we already had an art program, a theater program. I mean, uh, I mean, we, it's all part of the deal here. Uh, if it weren't, I wouldn't be here, and you wouldn't be here. Uh, uh, 
So we always, Plymouth has always understood that art is part of the spiritual life. Now there's different forms of art. For example, I hope to bring a guy here, I don't know if I can pull it off this winter or not, but I'm, I'm mentoring, a, yeah, mentoring, God, he's just this, this genius talent, Native American kid in Michigan who is just a spoken word guy like you can't believe. He's just incredible. And uh, spoken word is the booming, booming sector in the world of poetry. Actually, did you hear that thing uh, that uh, Seth did a few weeks ago? Those two guys, I I've, I've booked them for a program. They were just incredible. And so spoken word, which is often tied to music, hip, hip hop, there's a whole kind of rhythm in it that you can do because we get the rhythm back, right? We get the rhyme back. What, what my guy in, in, in Michigan does is what he calls multi-factor rhyme. I mean, three, four syllable rhymes, one after the other. I mean, that's hard to do when he just rips them down the page or down the performance, their performances. So, um, that's cooking, and we could do more of that here. Uh, uh, that what Seth did the other day with that young, the keyboardist and the and the and the spoken word guy. Wow, and we wanted more of that. But that's just because the whole world is moving that way, you know. And as for the rest of it, I ain't no expert, uh, but except to make clear what this talk is about, that it's all of us, and that this church is not only open to this, it wants this. It wants this kind of discussion. It wants this understanding that the tears are the windows to the soul. And I'll end, it. I don't know what the time it is, but I'll end with this story. When I was at the Star Tribune, one of the worst guys in the United States, Monster Cody, he made national news. He was a gang member from Compton, and he beat people to death left right and center. That was his M.O. in the gang culture of Compton, California. So he ends up in jail, guess what? And he is uh, in, uh, on, uh, I think it might have been a 60 Minutes piece on him, I really can't remember, but there's a journalist, TV journalist piece about him. And they talked to him, Who, what's your story? You know, the usual macho, uh, meh, meh, meh. tell us about your father. The windows to the soul open right up. It's in all of us. We all have that. And uh, we all have, but he didn't have a way to get, he beat people to death because he didn't know how to do this, right? We got to help people do this. Uh, our spiritual life and what we do here day in and day out and out in the world. To let people get that happen. Actually, uh, she has a mic, but okay. then we have to be done. Yeah, okay. So I was going to ask a question that's kind of the opposite of where you've been going, but maybe deeper in. I don't know. It is, what about, I'm thinking of scientific or something, exploration and creativity. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of Edison. I don't really know how this is true. Or somebody who really wants to get at something that, that, that'll work. Steve Jobs, I mean, maybe that's a really bad example, but some people have this drive to get, to get something that seems like a spiritual quest. Well, I'm a big fan of Steve Jobs, by the way. I'm a big fan of Steve Jobs, who's, who you know, dropped out of college but listened in, uh, audited the classes on typography. You know, that's why the Mac looks so good. Uh, he understood typography. He had many things. He lived on squirrels, by the way, while he was uh, literally. Uh, and uh, so uh, he's a good example. We, uh, maybe Jeff Bezos has kind of lost his way with a yacht bigger than this church. I think we could stop that little nonsense. But, but I don't know. The great thing about art is you don't have to be Jeff Bezos or Steve Jobs. Or, or any of us, because it's wide open. There's nobody who can't do it. Nobody who can't do it, and everybody should do it in some form. And we're, we're having this. One of the great successes, I taught a little bit in the Goodyear County Jail. I had, and men and women, cl separate classes, obviously, I had everybody crying in 30 minutes, everybody. Because I would ask them questions about their children and about their parents, and whoa, we went right down there. I mean, everybody's got a story, and how do you get it out, though? So I say, here, get up a all you need when you're in a jail or in a prison, there's prison writing programs now all over, what do you need? A pencil, 
which they give you, because you can't even wrap your own, and a pad of paper. And I've seen some people there who have walked in with, with notebooks filled with rage and despair. And I've seen others who just started. But all of us can do it. There's nobody who can't do it. And, not, and I think, well, you know this. This is, not, this, is not, this is not rocket science. This is fundamental. Everybody can access art, and they know they need to to get at the sea within themselves. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. That was, that was super. I know there are more questions, and if you stay over, they sure, can probably sure. get you one-to-one. -one. And then, as I mentioned before, this is our last forum of the year. We are not going to have a program next week on Christmas Eve or the following week, New Year's Eve. But we will start again on January 7th, three weeks from today. And then somebody from Beacon Housing Interfaith Collaborative, um, that's a mouthful, Chris La Tondresi, I think I'm murder murdering that name. Anyway, he's going to talk to us about affordable housing in the Twin Cities. So we hope you come back then. And thanks again, Jim. All right.